Hey guys, um, so now we're going to talk about migraines. Um, so what's different about migraines is, is that compared to tension headaches, which there's, I think tension, think the T in tension is like it's tight um, and um, it's tight and tense in the neck and or that band around the head. Migraines are actually one-sided usually um, and they're, you, the patient would usually describe them as a throbbing pain uh, and it's usually going to be on their temple. Sometimes they may even say like that, like it's like synced with their pulse. Like they, it's like they can feel their heart beating. It's like, uh, uh, like, you know, it's like, it's just very uncomfortable. Um, and so, uh, they also on top of having their pain can have other symptoms. Um, we already talked about how tension headaches, they can have the sensitivity to light noise odors. Um, but, uh, the difference here is that migraine, uh, people with migraines can also start to experience GI symptoms like nausea, vomiting, a lot of irritability and sweating. Um, and they also can have an aura, which we're going to talk about on the next slide. Um, migraines can be triggered by a lot of different things. You want to think about like foods and especially like there's foods with certain ingredients in them. We're going to talk about general like headache trigger foods later, but it's pretty much all the good stuff like caffeine, red wine, aged cheese. I know you're wondering, you're like, wait, how is caffeine a trigger for migraines if it's also possibly a treatment too? It's just different. Like there's certain levels of caffeine that are helpful, um, but there is a certain level where it's like, hey, that's not helpful. Like the nurse that um, I talked to the other day that did uh, had his coffee with six shots in it. And I was like, oh, Jesus. Um, uh, you know, menstrual changes or hormonal changes can trigger migraines. Um, some people know when their period's coming because of their migraines. Um, and then any sort of physical exertion, fatigue, or stress, AKA nursing school. Um, one of my friends in nursing school had migraines like really bad. I always felt for her because it was every time, especially when things were super stressful, that it got worse. I mean, yes, if you're hangry, it definitely can increase your risk for a migraine. Um, it's also associated, like there's some chronic illnesses that are associated with migraines, like those with asthma, depression, stroke, irritable bowel, hypertension, um, the list goes on. This is why, like, I really, like, I struggled, like, I would not spend a lot of time writing out these lists. Just, it seems like life is a trigger for migraines, right? Um, but anyway, oh, let's try. Oh, and if you don't know where your temple is, it's right here, kind of here on your head. If you've never had to rub your temple and or be dramatic, it'd be like, oh, anyway. Um, so an aura is what we were talking about before. And you can have an aura um, before a seizure. It can be before a variety of things. But aura for a headache or a migraine, I should say, is um, it's the same thing. It's just what happens after. So um, an aura is pretty much think of it like a warning sign that's saying, hey, migraine coming in. Or for some people, it'd be like, hey, a seizure's coming. Uh, most people have a visual aura. And what that would look like is some sort of bright lights, um, patchy blindness, some visual distortion or zigzag lines. It could look like this picture. Um, I'm not saying that's what it would look like. It just depends. Um, but there are usually some sort of visual cues that are telling you, hey, um, incoming migraine, you know, et cetera, coming. Um, but um, it also could be auditory or like certain sounds you're hearing or strange smells as well. So they can actually get into any of your senses. Um, how we manage migraines a little bit different than what we do for tension headaches. We do some of the same uh, first line stuff like the aspirin and NSAIDs. Um, but then if there is um, so like moderate to severe um, migraines, we usually go for what are called SRAs or serotonin receptor agonists. Um, these are considered a first line for moderate to severe migraines. If they persist, we can also do things like Botox, which we'll talk about. Um, and then in general, we want to tell people to take their migraine medication earlier. The earlier they take it, the better it, off they are. So if they're getting an aura, like take their medicine then or right when the headache starts, don't wait, see if it will pass, et cetera. Um, and then for these patients, since they have more of a uh, um, overwhelming, like the nausea, vomiting, um, a lot of times they're... Um, the sensitivity to light sounds is a lot worse. So quiet, dimly lit environment. All right, let's do a question. A nurse is caring for a client with a new diagnosis of migraines that is going to be taking a serotonin receptor agonist, which statement by a client would require further action by the nurse prior to administering the medication. Statements, sorry, select all that apply. Um, so they're about to take a serotonin receptor agonist. Um, what would require more action? So what would cause me to say, hey, I don't know if I can give this. So first one is I have a history of tension headaches. So would have a history of tension headaches 
um, put them um, that, that now has a new diagnosis of migraines, would that change their ability to take this? I don't think it would, even though that's not a treatment for tension. Now they have migraines. So I don't think a history of headaches is a counter, um, like a contraindication. Uh, history of osteoarthritis. There is some things that I think you can't take SRAs with if you have a history, but I don't think having arthritis um, puts you at risk. And here's one thing I'll say is that usually when we choose distractors for questions like this, we choose something else that you're being tested over or that you know. And sometimes when it's something familiar, like it starts to get in your mind and you're like, oh, uh, uh. And sometimes we want you to do, we want you to do that because we want you to think like, is there a connection here? But just know, just because we're learning about it right now, like don't second guess yourself if you're like, hey, I don't remember anything about osteoarthritis in that med or something. So like, don't second guess yourself just because it's something else we learned about. Um, I have a history of seizures. Um, this is not a contraindication to taking SRAs either. Um, so um, there is something else though. But hey, we have two more choices. So the next one is I had a, so, so far everything is not requiring further action. They're okay to have the, that history. Next one is I had an ischemic stroke last year, and this is going to be something that is a, uh, some, I can talk, I'm really losing it already <laughs> and it, it's early. I still have a few more videos to make. Um, so this is something that is something that would require further action um, prior to administering it. Um, and then the last one, I have a history of hypertension also is a reason um, to that would require further action. What you really want to think about here is if they've had a stroke um, or have high blood pressure, really cardiovascular disease, um, they're going to be, um, they're going to, it's going to be a contraindication to them taking it. And I'll talk about it now. So the answer is there would be D and E. The big thing with this is, is that those that have high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, disease or stroke, um, it's not going to really be safe for them to take it. And the reason is, is the way that this works is it reduces inflammation um, in the, uh, what do you call them, around the structures of the brain, which cool, but it also causes vasoconstriction. And if I have a history of high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease or stroke, I do not want that constriction. I do not want the blood vessel um, complications because I'm already at risk for having a problem. I've had a problem in the past. So really think anyone with that cardiovascular disease history we're really going to be concerned of. Um, so these meds, um, the serotonin receptor agonists, also known as like Amitrex, if you've heard of them, um, it's all the triptans. Um, so that's all that they, um, the all the meds end in triptan. Um, these are used for acute treatment of um, uh, of the migraines. It can also be used for cluster headaches. We'll talk about it. Um, and the cool thing about these is they can be given oral, subcutaneous, nasal spray, transdermal. Like there's a lot of different ways. So since people have like nausea, vomiting sometimes, um, there's alternatives and other ways to do. But again, just keep in mind, watch out for those people with vascular issues. Uh, then I mentioned also that you can use Botox for migraines. Um, Botox is used more for prevention. It's for people that like they've tried a lot of things and nothing is working. Um, they do multiple injections around the head and neck into the pain fibers. Um, it can take up to six months to truly see the effects of this. And in that time, they need to keep taking their medicines. It's not that they get the Botox and they're like, oh, I'm good to go. Um, they need to continue to take their medicine um, and they have to get injections every three months really to keep it up. So this is usually used if just like other stuff is not working. And I'm going to have a section at the end. There's other like preventative, like for all headaches and stuff like that. I'm going to talk more about that. There is alternative treatments too for all headaches, um, but I'm just talking about the main ones here. Okay. That's it for migraines. I'll see you for cluster. Oh, nope, nope. I'm going to try to. All right. Uh, bye.